Tom is presenting on reads, which is a bane of my existence. I know nothing about them because people always do them for me. So if you would like to say anything to Tom, we all say hi. Hey, Tom. Hello. Hi. Right. Yeah, so I'll, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I'll talk about reads. Um, that could take two minutes or 20 minutes or two hours. Um, but then I'll also talk about, because I know a lot of you are composers, I'll also talk about composing for the Ichibiki. One thing that I'll start off with, and some of this is for, since we're not in Tokyo, and some of you may only have one read or two reads, and they may have to last another year or two, is how to make these reads not die so quickly. And one good way is the traditional way, of course, of soaking your read in hot green tea. The heat of the from the green tea or hot water degrades the fibers, so it will start. It will stop vibrating as much. So you can just um, put it in room temperature water. It will take longer, but we're not doing any concerts or anything where you have to dip it in hot water and be ready to play at that moment. Um, if you're in a situation where it's closed up and you have to do it that way, then yes, use the hot. Carry around one of your little trusty thermos bottles with cold water. Or sometimes I will just put the read in my mouth as I'm walking to a lesson or rehearsal. That will increase the life of your read. Anything you can do to keep from touching I don't know how focused this is. Anything you can do to keep from touching, especially the tip where it's the thinnest, the sides, anything uh, to keep from damaging the fibers. That, that's what's vibrating. Um, anytime you press it, you can damage those fibers. And that's whether you're gonna have the read for one month or one year. Try not to touch it. And when you are finished playing if you can put the cap on, so you close up the reed very easily with your fingers and put the cap on while it's still soft and wet. If you let it dry out and then you have to physically close it, again, you're damaging the fibers of it. So those are some just quick tips on keeping the reed alive longer. Since some of us play gagaku and modern music. It's good if you have some zugami, the washi, so you can easily roll it to make it thicker so it doesn't go so far down. So that will change the pitch. Um, so you have your rolled for your 430 or your 440, unroll it. What I do is I have, instead of one big roll, um, I roll it with two. So I have my set for 430, and then I have another strip that I can roll in in case you're doing a concert that you have to play both. So it's easy enough to unroll one and unroll, and it's just one piece. Now, if you have a um, was that candle to put it on, if not, you can use find a pin that will hold it. Again, this is to keep, well, to hold it and also so you're not pressing down. And this is for when you're using a reed knife or sandpaper. So you're not pressing down with your fingers so hard that it takes it out of shape. So you can put a pencil in or you can use the candle. If your reed is too hard, when you get them new, they're usually too hard. Even the like student models quite often are too hard. You can play on it a little bit. The, con the continued playing on it will soften it up some. If you have a reed knife, um, if you don't have a reed knife, uh, you can use sandpaper. Or if you just have a regular sharp knife, just be careful. And you can, and again, I don't know how focused this is or not. Again, if you can stay away from the tip, stay away from the, especially the sides here. And this center part here, which for clarinet reads, we call it the heart, but stay away from that center part. And 
if it's a little too hard, one of the first things that I do is just slightly below. I will shave off just a couple of scrapes. You can always take wood off. You can't put it back on, on both sides. And also when you get your reed, if you can see one that's more open. If you can check that both sides, the tip is equal in thickness. If one side is not as thick um, or you see some irregularities in it, then that's a good place even at the tip, just a little bit better if you're de dealing with the tip with sandpaper to just shave off a little bit. So it's symmetrical, same thickness on both sides. So it vibrates better. Some players, and I know I do it, I have the bottom a little bit thicker than the top. Um, because there's a little bit more pressure on the bottom. So I want that a little bit extra uh, resistance, uh, but it's better probably uh, that they're equal. And one easy way to know if you were shaving off, whether you're using sandpaper, is take a pencil and mark where you think it's too thick make it black, I don't think you can see that. Then take your sandpaper, your reed knife and just shave off that much so that marking isn't there. Then you know you've gotten some off, but not too much. And then try it and keep doing that. I wouldn't take a hard reed that you first get and then shave it down until it's working that first day because you do want to break it in. What I do with the break-in procedure is I will I mean, if it just won't play at all, then you you can't play it. So you do need to shave off some, but maybe no more than five minutes a day. Also, if you have two reads or more, alternate them. Um, so you're not playing on one read all the time. So when you get that first, that new one, play it for five minutes, put it away, play on something else, come back for five minutes and five minutes, and that can go on for about two weeks. You can also... Even if you're not playing it, uh, you can wet it, have it open, have it sit. If it dries, that's fine. Wet it, then close it up again. So each day it's getting, um, it's absorbing water. Usually there's not too much issue with Hichibiki reeds that they warp because of the little cap that you're putting on it. If you find that it's another place where you can shave it some, or if the some reads that what I call, because it's the clarinet terminology, this first cut that keeps the semi from going, sometimes it wears down and the, or the semi is too big and it just flops down. You can take your reed knife and just rock it back and forth so you're digging a little ditch there and then shave a little bit off. So you get that little ledge, sorry. So you get that ledge that's going to stop. You're not going to be touching the part from here back, just from here down. Another place where you can shave off a little bit is just on the shoulders here and here. So you have this sort of in or you, whichever way you're looking at it. You can shave off a little bit here. Again, be very careful at the edges here because if they get too thin, they will open up and crack. Those are the basic things. Questions? Could, yeah. Could you recap where I'm supposed to not shave? Yeah. Not at the tip you can do here is okay, a little bit behind the tip. And sometimes and I do this with clarinet reeds. Um, I don't know about bassoon reeds, but the first thing I do, if it's too hard, I will just shave below the tip just a little bit. 
and that can um, give it a little bit less resistance. But I almost never shave the tip itself. You can use sandpaper if you really think it's too hard. You can use sandpaper and just very always going this way and you can shave it down or sandpaper it down just very lightly. And one of the most delicate areas on the reed, and because sometimes when you're putting your semi on it, you can touch, is this corner here. It's one of the thinnest spots, one of the most delicate spots, and you want to keep away from that with your fingers, your semi, your sandpaper, so that doesn't get too thin. If putting the semi on sometimes, you know, it gets a little crack, that's fine. Going the other way, if the reed has gotten old and too soft, you can take, I'm not gonna do it on this reed. As you can see my little curve already here on my sandpaper. You can take sandpaper and just rub it this way. So you're getting rid of the old soft worn out tip and very, very slowly and keep trying it very, very slowly, keep trying it until you feel like you have a new tip. And then sometimes when you do that, when you have a new tip, then you need to shave some of the back here. But to answer your question, rarely the tip and stay away from the sides. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to make this all about me, but can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, so I have these, uh, you mentioned like the beginner sets. I have a pack of three reeds that were all, you know, pre-shaved, but they don't have that little notch you were talking about. Yes. That stops the semi. Is that something I'm supposed to put in? You, you should. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here is, this is one that I made. Um, it's not finished yet. I don't have the notch in it and I wouldn't. I can't tell you how many millimeters, centimeters, inches, or whatever mm -hmm. it goes, how far it goes down. I just use a older, older reed. And there you can, I think you can see the line and then make the line. And that's where you do need a knife, whether it's a reed knife or just a regular knife. I wouldn't use a razor blade for it. That could be a little dangerous, but just a knife and Put, I put my finger and then I just rock back and forth. I, I don't try to saw it because that might go too deep. And I just rock it back and forth until you get a little notch and then start doing that just a little bit. And you just keep doing that and you get a nice ledge that like this one uh yeah this one you can actually see you don't want to dig in too much because then the part you've dug in too much can be incredibly thin and then you've got the thick heart and that will mess with the vibrations of the cane but just rocking back and forth until you get that ledge where you know it will stop is that answer yeah, the question? I, yeah, I have like nine reads to break tonight, so we'll figure yeah. it out. And none of none of them have that notch, the first cut? No. Um, yeah, I was given a few fresh reads, and then I bought a couple of these uh, beginner sets. Yeah. Uh, I have a just gen uh, sort of general question. Um, it's interesting to hear how much of this sort of carries over into bassoon reed making as well. Uh, I'm curious though, in terms of the reed knife, um, is there a particular, because I know some people might hold it slightly differently if you're going after different things. I was wondering, maybe could you talk a little more about that? I'm left-handed and I have never, even with, I make my own clarinet reeds. I often, you see people with clarinet or even this, they are shaving towards themselves. 
I, I've never, I'm not sure. I think it was because when I started with a reed knife, it was a right hand reed knife. So it was backwards. And I've always felt more comfortable and more control of anchoring the backside of the reed knife with my finger and going this way. And sandpaper doesn't make any difference, but yeah, I've always felt more comfortable. And if I'm doing here, and it's so I'm not just blindly doing here, because that way, if you do this, when you hit it and start, it could be a little bit too deep, that first slide. So I anchor it with my finger and it's already there and then just slowly do it. I have another reed knife where instead of this sharp tip, it's rounded. And sometimes I will use that. I'm a little worried sometimes, especially on a hichiriki reed or the tip of a clarinet reed with this end, especially going up near here. So often on the tip, I, I will use sandpaper instead of the reed knife. Cool, thanks. With bassoon reeds, do you use different part of the knife for it depends different on shaving? Yeah, especially early on in the beginning of the stage. I haven't made a reed in six years, but I remember that the more sawing you did, the further, the closer you got to the handle. So like if you really need to get a lot of crap off, you might use the go towards the end. Because there's a right, lot I mean but yeah. then, Speaking, it's like almost exclusively you use the very top of the knife and you try and you always try to take as little as you need to yeah um, as little as take off a little that's why with the it's nice to put the little um pencil marking and just shave off so you don't see the pencil marking yeah. um and it also depends on how comfortable you are with the knife i'm usually more comfortable with it not at the end because it's further away from my finger. And so I just feel more comfortable with it here. The sh sharpness of the this knife, um, maybe like kitchen knives or whatever, it gets thicker up here, but this, I'm not gonna cut myself, but this, the it's the same thickness or thinness or sharpness all the way from top to here. I have a question uh, about storing the reeds because uh, sometimes I'm not sure, you know, like it's all wet and I put it to my case and I close it and go, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to also ask uh, how long do you keep one washi on and if you change it ever or if you leave it forever, like how, how long the washi paper can last? Washi, I... I leave on, yeah. Um, I always, as soon as I finish playing, I take the reed out because I have learned sometimes you're playing, you put it down, the reed is still in there. You come back an hour later and it has dried out. You pull the reed out, but the washi stays in there. And then it's a real pain getting a tweezer or um, usually I use a chopstick from this end to push it out. I put the tip on set it aside before putting it in the case. And also, I mean, I have, you know, the all of these reeds that I keep in this plastic and I make sure that they are dry. The humidity packs, which I will, if you have it very, a low, very low one, like 35, and I will put that in one of these uh, to make it, to make it dry. You can always get humidity in your reed by putting it in water. I found out this summer in Tokyo, I had this case and I thought it had dried out and I put the reed in there and I was using reeds from this case. And a few weeks later, I came back to this case and it was, it was fluffy. It was very, very fluffy. So mold had gone and it was airtight but it was wet inside and there was mold. There, there were some very good reeds, so I refused to throw them away. So I soaked it in per peroxide and then let them dry in the sun. I usually don't keep a reed in my case because I have these cases. And I'm a little concerned about if the reed, especially the washi is still wet, 
by putting it in, especially if you're at a rehearsal and then you stick it in there. And I'm worried about that. Also for the Hichiriki, the, I don't, I don't know if it, the Tsubaki oil to, to oil the outside. You don't have to worry about the inside because it's lacquered. It will dry out. If it dries out, it <laughs> might crack. This is not so easy to find. Um, I got this in Tokyo. You can use almond, pure almond oil. And what I do is I just take, um, I just use my, I, a few times I used a Q-tip, dipped it in the oil and put it in. Um, but then there were some little fuzzies from the Q-tip. So now I just put the oil on my fingers and just go and just all the way, all the way down. And then I leave it out overnight. Um, I don't put it back in the case. Sometimes it, depending on how dry it is, sometimes it absorbs all of it. Sometimes the next day, there's still a lot. You can take a, um, I use a silk cloth to then dry it. I would imagine a cloth, a cotton cloth is fine to lightly wipe off the oil. And I also will, I do use a Q-tip to clean the finger holes. If you're playing a lot, sometimes as you're playing, there's a little crud that gets in these, these holes. And they're so small that the least bit of crud that gets in there can affect the pitch or the sound. So I do take a Q-tip and just clean out the hole. I also have this to, to clean out the inside. You could come up with something else, a little piece of cloth, maybe a Q-tip, but I don't think it's thick enough, just to clean out the um, what we call condensation from the inside of it. So that is dry. Uh, I have another reed making question because we talked a little bit last time about how I had these very, these unfinished reeds. And I'm just wondering the order that I should go in with respect like we, we talked a little bit about how to, uh, you know, make the little ledge and the cut and stuff. So I think I understand that. I also noticed that the end of the reed is flat and needs to be, I think, sanded down into a, like, you know, the horseshoe shape. Yeah. So you just, you just go. I, I just, mean, very, very careful. And usually I will do one side at a time and just very slowly, very slowly, and then the other side until they match. Um, when it gets to both sides are rounded, but it still looks, a, then I will do, you know, it all at one time. But I start with doing one side at a time until I get the rounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just very slowly with the sandpaper. And when you're putting your reed on, Again, if you can try to not touch this area, because those fibers are what are, is vibrating. And once the fibers break, I mean, you won't see them that they're broken or flattened. Try to hold the reed here and stick it in. And of course, sometimes it's a little, and you start pressing here, um, you can break it. But as smooth as possible, Put it there. And again, try not to use it on this side pushing in because you can be causing problems here, but just as easy as possible, push it in. If you find that you have to push too hard, then you've got too much paper around. So take off just a little bit of paper so it, you can put it in at the right length for 430. And that, and that it's not rocking because you don't want it to rock back and forth. And especially with Hichiriki, if you're playing, the tendency is when you're playing that it'll start going in further as you play. If that happens, that sh that's a sign that you've got too much tension and pressing too hard, but you want enough paper that it won't start going in and also not rock like, like rocking like this. Okay, one more question with this specific read, and uh, this may be 
too specific, but I've noticed it happen with a couple reads that the state of the read right now is, um, I don't, my, the camera's probably not focusing at all. You can see there's a little yeah. crack there along the side, right at the tip. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty short. Um, so I don't know when that happened. I've kind of had them in a Tupperware for like a year because I've yep. been afraid to work on them. But uh, is that like, what, what should I glean from the fact that that's there? Like, does it mean the read is unsalvageable or is it just no. going to affect the playing? No, it, it should. If it's just a little bit there at the tip, on the side, it, it should be fine. Um, I have a read that, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you, ah, yes, you can probably see it. Um, I don't know if you, you see this line here? Yeah. That is a crack all the way down. Um, uh, it, it is a very good soft read. And I, I still use it for when I specific person, you know, purposes if I want something very soft. When I saw the crack, um, I thought, oh, it's dead and it was a good read, but it still works. I also have some reads that that side completely opens up. That can hurt the sound. Sometimes it will kill the read, but when you have the semi on, that's usually going to close up that crack crack or opening that that will keep it closed it it's not great but i wouldn't throw i wouldn't throw one of your reads away because of it um if it works then it doesn't matter how it looks uh -huh. okay yeah all right good to know thank you okay one more read making question yeah. uh because i just i don't know like We've talked about shaving it down from like when it's in like this state, but how does it how does it get flattened? Like, how does the tip get flattened? A hot clamp. It's probably made out of cast iron. Maybe it's this big, and they heat they heat the clamp and clamp it, and that will that will flatten it because the heat causes the Kang, the well, it's not Kang, it's Reed, to flatten, and then they they leave it on that clamp for a while until it is until it stays flattened. And it really, it looks like scissors, and then at the bottom, instead of it being this way, it's flat on both sides and clamps down on it. Mm -hmm. I was curious if you've ever experimented with the size of the reed and tuning. So if you try to make like smaller reeds or bigger reeds to make base hichiriki, like the all hichiriki, yeah. like. Yeah, I have, um, I may, I haven't used, I haven't tried smaller ones, but I have tried bigger ones. I play the Chinese guans and this is the reed. Uh, so comparison, it, The length is almost the same, but it's much thicker. And of course, this way, it's much thicker. And the tip is thicker and it stays flat. This is not paper, it is um, cloth. And I have used that. You use, I have to, I, this I have wrapped up for the guans at the moment, so it's too thick, but I've put it in. This is modern electrician's tape, but yeah, I've put it in and the sound, it's not open. It's the same thing where you have to soak it in water and it gives it a much deeper, more mellow sound than the Hichiriki reed. Like this is a very fat and, it, and it's, it's a little bit longer and it, and it does sound different and I'm not bothered shaping it into the traditional size. So I have different sizes. Any other questions? I, I have two composer specific questions. Uh, yes. One related to tuning and one is related to durability and altissimo. Um, whereas when you get a buck, cause I know there's a really horrendously loud and screeching territory 
past the high A, but if memory serves, you either have to bite the semi or you have to put your teeth on the reed or both. And I'm told that's ba very bad for the reed, right? It's very bad. You know, yeah. The... Um, I, my teeth are on it. It's bad, but I'm, I'm hardly putting any pressure at all. Yeah. And that is, that's just lip, that's not teeth. So they. And that's not loud, I think, for Hichiriki. You're... The Hichiriki can play soft. If you had to stick to one tuning, uh, like 430 verse, because I remember you had that one insane piece by Vesikala, where it had a lot of quarter tones and a lot of really insane intervals. But I remember we were talking about it. It looked like it should have been written for the 431 rather than the 442 Ichiriki because there were so many quarter tones to begin with. I was just wondering um, if um, you had a preference for playing at 442 or playing for 430 or does it, or does it not really matter? If it's quarter tones and you're not playing with other instruments, or if you're playing with, of course, if you're playing with other 430 instruments, then tune. But if it's a Kichibiki solo, it, if it's quarter tones, it doesn't matter if you're playing 430 or 440, because the the distance between it, it doesn't make any difference to me. I have no real preference of whether I'm playing in 440 or 430. You know, it depends on. Uh, what I, I, you know, if I'm playing in a concert and I'm only playing with piano and when it's all 430, then that's fine. What I find confusing is if I have to play two pieces and one's at 430 and then I have to change to 440 to switch the ear to hear the difference can bother me a little bit, especially if I've been playing mostly 440 and then switch to 430. Often when I come in, of course, with Hichiriki, it's sort of okay. You come in out of tune and you immediately scoop down or you scoop up. So, and that's a typical Hichiriki sound anyway, so it's okay. But I don't like to play both in the same concert because I feel a little unsettled. But as far as if it's by itself, it, it wouldn't matter. So just, just to clarify something you had said earlier, the the length of the reed does not change. It's only the amount of tape that's on it. Yes, I don't, I don't know. All, I mean, all, almost all of my reeds are the same length. Okay, cool. Um, yep. No, I just changed the paper so it either will go in further or not go in. So for 440, I take some paper off so it goes further in. I mean, I guess I just have like a, a general, not so much instrument related question. For example, how do you get to where you are today with Gagaku? And if I want to keep playing the Hijiki a long time, which I do, uh, what should I do? You know, like where should I go with it? I guess is is you know a very open ended question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. When I first started, I. <clears throat> was looking for Hichibiki teacher, but I specifically wanted one that played both contemporary and gagaku. And they gave me to um, Hitami because she plays both. And that it is, it's not common that players will play in both. Get composers to write pieces for you, uh, which is probably the easiest way. I mean, you can find pieces that are already written but probably the easiest way is to work with, I mean, you're a composer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So find other composers or write your own pieces. What I started doing, I wanted to play Hichiriki on my, I mean, most of what I do is play clarinet. Uh, mostly it's pieces written for me. And I, but I wanted to start including Hichiriki. So a few months after I started playing Hichiriki, someone wrote me a piece and I played it on the concert. And I learned a lot from that, like when, when to put the piece on the program. I made a big mistake. I left my reed wrapped in wet paper because I was playing a clarinet piece and then would have to pick up the Hichiriki. And I didn't want the audience to sit there while I'm waiting to fix the reed. The reed was so open 
that I was using such pressure to get it closed and vibrate. It was awful, but I learned a lot. I would suggest just get composers to write you pieces and practice the gagaku. And you can do that outside of this class, of course. Even though most of what I do with Hichiriki is contemporary, my lessons with Hitomi are probably 75% gagaku because we feel it's important to have that base knowledge and that history. And I think it's important. And then that makes the contemporary stuff rather easy. How did you start out with her? Were you in Japan at the time? Yeah, I was a very horrible shakuhachi player. For 15 years, I've been living in both Tokyo and New York, and I wanted to play a traditional Japanese instrument. And a friend of mine is a shakuhachi maker. So I was like, oh, okay. And I played flute. And so I thought this would be easy, and it wasn't. And I took lessons there with a very good player. I took lessons here with Ralph Samuelson. It was endlessly frustrating. My fingers, of course, would work, but the sound production, especially beginning a sound, was never 100% there. And other shakuhachi players would say, that's the life of a shakuhachi player. That was very frustrating to me because I wanted to play the shakuhachi in concert. And the last time I played shakuhachi in concert was in Tokyo, this big, like almost 1000 seat theater. And I was playing with bass koto, piano and shakuhachi and eight bars with koto solo, eight bars piano and koto. Then shakuhachi came in with a D, two whole notes and then some flurry stuff. And I blew, and it was air. The pianist looks at me, and I'm like nodding at her, like, just keep going. I'm blowing, nothing. And of course, I froze, but my fingers did. And so I just kept blowing and fingering. Occasionally, a sound would come out. It. I was humiliated. I'm in Japan. And audience loved it. We were in kimono, so I think they were distracted by the visual and they thought it was so beautiful and that beautiful airy sound. Of course, it could be that that was their subtle way of saying you really sucked um, because I had a beautiful airy sound. And I decided I can't, I'm, this is too frustrating and embarrassing. And my shakuhachi teacher in Tokyo said, do you know the hichiriki? I said, oh. I guess our days are numbered here. But he knew how frustrated I was. And I said, well, I've heard of it. So I got one, I found the teacher, went to Hitomi's first lesson, told her what I wanted. I wanna play it in concerts with clarinet. And within 15 minutes, 15 minutes, she said, ah, you're gonna be fine. It, maybe because it was a reed instrument, it made sense to me, the sound production of it and so that was it. So, and I'm glad that I was a very bad shakuhachi player. <laughs> yeah. I've probably had maybe 25, 30 hichiriki pieces written for me. And it's nice when the composer knows what they're doing and it's not nice when they don't. So it's, it's good to have that knowledge of how to write for the hichiriki. So I guess what we could do is maybe we could share your email, Tom, though I know on Canvas, there is the link for Tom's website. It has a lot of information all about him. And I'm assuming there's a contact part of there your is. website. Yeah. So people yeah. can reach out to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for speaking, Tom. It's really good to have you as a resource and as a friend. Yay. And we have, you know, several oboists here too. So I think it like kind of reaches across to pretty much everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yay. That's awesome. Um, if you ever decide that you're holding like a, like a tuition read making class, because I know a lot of my <laughs> oboist friends, you know, you, you pay for like the class time and the, and the supplies. I'm sure mm. there might be people when people are together again perhaps <laughs> maybe just keep us posted because <laughs> yeah yeah you're the only person i think that's i mean devin makes reads 
Um, but I think you're the only person that like makes reads. So it's an art that we just don't have access to regularly. So don't mm. die or anything like you were saying about. Why, Nakamura. thank you. That's yeah. good advice. <laughs> Stick around for a long time. Um, so oh. thank you, Tom, for like, yay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. I, hope it, I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah.